Okay, so now for the questions. Just, just before I start the questions, I realise my ego got a bit carried away with me earlier and presumed that everybody in the room knew me. But for those, for those that don't, I'm Ornia Lynch and I'm the CEO of the National Parents Council, so I'll introduce myself now. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll give the Minister maybe a little bit of time to rest and we'll start with um, Joyce. Now, you'll have to bear with me, Joyce. This is, this is a long question. We are a fledgling parents association in a school for special needs children. Parental involvement has been actively discouraged in the school. For example, I have been asked not to enter my daughter's classroom with her when I bring her to school. The principal has um, lied to the Parents Association about a decision which was made by the school manager, manager, not the board of management for the last 18 months, and has paid lip service to the concerns which were expressed by the Parents Association, but made no efforts to act or to make any changes. We feel that it is becoming very difficult to have any meaningful working relationship with the school and yet need to for the sake of our children. Have you any advice? <laughs> We're not starting with an easy one, I'm afraid. <laughs> the, um, <clears throat> one of the things that I mentioned in my talk with you is if the principal is not ready to make this happen, it is not going to happen. Uh, in Connecticut, I was visiting a school way back when we were first starting our work. There were two fences around the school. Fence one, chain linked fence, chain two. Parents were not allowed past the first fence. That was more than metaphor. A new principal came into that school and took down both fences. And that was more than metaphor. The way that we work with reluctant principles is gingerly. <laughs> uh, the idea that um, the principals often, and teachers too, frankly, why isn't more of what I was talking about just happening regularly? Educators are not prepared in their teacher training to understand and do the work of partnershiping. In uh, principal's training, they may have one day of a course that says how to deal with parents. <laughs> that is not how to partner with parents. So I'm encouraged by the minister's discussion of new approaches in teacher training. Now, the questioner does not want to wait <laughs> until that happens. But it is very difficult unless you can capture the ear of an assistant principal, if there is such a thing, or a lead teacher, or someone who's going to say at your parent association meeting, you know, I think there's a fear. Often the reluctance is based on fear. In my textbook for college courses, I have a little section where it's an activity for people where the principal or the teacher engaged is thinking of the worst nightmare parent they ever met in their lives. And they then characterize all parents by the worst nightmare parent. Now, the worst nightmare parent is out there. <laughs> Not in this room. Out there. When I was teaching before I went back to school, I met one of them. <laughs> And the issue really is 99% of parents are not like that. They just want to know, how do I help my child do better in school? How can I really advocate? How can I assist? How can I be part of that audience that supports the band, the chorus, the drama production, and so forth? So somebody likes that person. <laughs> somebody has a positive relationship with that principal who can say, you know, there's another way to go about this that will take some of the burden off your shoulder. The team takes off the fear of what's going on in people's minds who think they have to do everything connected with parents themselves. And we had a principal in one of our pilot schools. We don't call, I was saying to Anya, we don't call them pilot anymore. Our network is 17 years old. We call it scaling up. <laughs> but the notion was this principal was conveying to fellow principals 
how this work with a team had helped him and said it changed the whole nature of the uh, complaints that come into a school. Whereas he used to try to deal with all of them himself, now he turns it over to the team on which there are teachers and parents as well as the principal. And they take the, the uh, challenges that come in or the complaints that come in in a different way from the way that you may know that ombudsmen are often hired to deal with complaints. If you hire an ombudsman to deal with complaints, you're, you're just waiting for the complaints to come in. If you have a team that's taking some uh, positive approaches, then you really have a different way of dealing with complaints. And this principal was saying that a kindergartner's parent was saying that the afternoon kindergarten had less hours of school than the morning kindergarten. And she was irate. She was angry and wanted this all to change. And he said all he did was refer the problem to the team. So in terms of this question, somebody has to get to the ear of the principal who likes that person and who the principal has a positive relationship. And they, let's try this new route. We'll, we'll have a team and see how it goes. Research says, uh, many schools, I'm sure here too, are told use research-based approaches. The approach that we talked about today is all based on the studies that we've done that were very technical. And my talk was not very technical. We turned it into the language that will be useful in practice. So if you cannot get to that person, the only result is get the new principal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Joyce. Okay, now, now to the minister. Um, I could have written this question myself, but I assure you I didn't. <laughs> um, do you agree that strengthening legislation is the best way to improve parental involvement at school level? Um, yes, I do. Um, we've got very little legislation in education for historical reasons. Uh, but one that will be of immense interest to all of you is a change in the enrollment policy legislation. Uh, we have a problem in that about 4,000 schools, 80% of them have no difficulty in accepting applicants from whatever background because they have the capacity uh, to uh, house them or to accommodate them. Uh, the NCSE, the National Council for Special Education, in a report recently published, <coughs> indicated that some parents of children with special education needs uh, encountered what were called soft barriers, quote unquote, where they were encouraged really to take their child to another school that would be better equipped or better resourced uh, to accommodate them. Uh, all sorts of speculative reasons as to why that might be the case. Uh, but, and then the other problem is just oversupply, a demand way in excess of, of, of the capacity for the system and people uh, not being able to get their child into a school because they didn't know that you had to, in fact, put the child's name down as soon as the child was conceived, let alone burn. Um, so we are, in fact, going to be publishing draft um, roles in, in relation to education enrollment, uh, and I would welcome the input of the MPC and other stakeholders when it's published. Uh, I would hope to have that published. Um, before the end of this uh, parliamentary session, which will be uh, in the middle of July. Um, Joyce, have, have you done any specific work or research with fathers? Yes. Uh, actually, that's a really timely question. So um, all of the work that was going on in the early 80s really was linked to mothers and all of the research that even survey research would ask, you know, it'd send home a survey and it would say, this survey should be addressed by the person who has the most contact with the child's school. Well, who was that? So over the last, um, I would say, 8, 10, 12 years, there's really been an emphasis on engaging fathers. And you'll see in our books of promising partnership practices, that we're trying to help schools alter and make the dads, granddads, or father figures, because in many cases the father can be absent, especially in certain communities in the States. There's father absence and there's also 
custodial issues, non-custodial fathers, and so forth. But there are now really an emphasis on opening and engaging all parents and grandparents who often are raising children in certain uh, cases as well. If we have a welcoming school, it's a welcoming school for everyone. Some activities are for all parents, fathers, mothers, grandparents, and others. And others are actually targeted to fathers. You'll see on our 2012 book of promising partnership practices an activity that brought dads, not just with sons, but with their child to um, a Saturday math activity that linked to building a bird feeder. And as they built the bird feeder, they would have math activities at each station so that it was a purposeful way to spend a Saturday morning and end up doing math, but also having a bird feeder to take home. Mm, donuts for dads, as I say, is a popular activity, but it only adds pounds to dad. <laughs> <laughs> and so our schools are changing that by linking to curriculum. Donuts for dads to focus on children's writing, where the child then becomes the feature in poetry or an essay or a story. They still might have the donuts, but it also increases a father's attention to the writing program. Then we're getting closer to the outcome oriented program that we're talking about. Thank you. Uh, Minister, can you respond to Joyce's presentation regarding the types of involvement she describes within the Irish context? Somebody checking to see if you were listening, I think. <laughs> I think the, the change in the culture of parents being engaged in their uh, education and, being, and taking some ownership of it uh, is, is very welcome. Um, it's only a generation ago really when most parents were deferential to the school and felt that the school knew best uh, and if you were punished in school you obviously deserved it. Um, I think parents now are much more self-confident because quite frankly the educational attainment of most parents now is much higher than it was um, many years ago. When I left school only 10% of the uh, same generation as myself went on to third level education of one kind or another. It's now 62% uh, and an awful lot of people have retrained uh, and are much more self-confident because we're a much more self-confident uh, state. Um, people are much more responsible for themselves in the opinions that they have, uh, in, their, in their own attitude to life in general. And that in essence, uh, obviously has come into the school space um, and I welcome it. Uh, I think parents have to be empowered First and foremost, and I said it at the time of the controversy over the PISA results back in 2009, that reading starts in the home and that uh, children have to be uh, read out loud. And I welcomed all of the points that um, Joyce made in relation to that. Um, I don't, I'm not aware, perhaps Anya, you might be from, from some schools, that most, most schools um, want to engage the parents. There is one problem, and it would be slightly different in, in, in our country, Joyce, but I'm sure it's, it's similar in, in, in principle uh, with schools all around the world. There are parents, and we have quite a few of them, who have a very bad experience of school. Whose, mine was a happy experience. I hope that, it, and you tend to assume that your experience is general. It's not, of course. Um, some parents had a very bad experience of school. Um, they weren't self-confident, they didn't um, learn terribly well in school and some schools in parts of disadvantaged areas in this country, particularly in this city, find it very difficult to get parents with the confidence to come on to the board of management and to participate. Uh, and also the links between the school and the community can be very weak. Uh, we have an additional problem that uh, in some of our disadvantaged areas the, the, the teacher is not a role model because the teacher comes from such a totally different background that the kids in the classroom simply cannot relate uh, to either the accent or the lifestyle or the manners, shall we say, uh, of the teacher. So it is something that we have to look at in the context of access programs, not just for university, for people coming from disadvantaged uh, uh, areas, but also access programs for, third for teacher colleges, so that actually we can get teachers into uh, schools and communities uh, where they can relate. My colleague Aon O'Reardon, who's a now a Doyle deputy um, from Clontarf uh, taught in an inner city school in Cherry Street, not a million miles from here, uh, and he was talking about 
uniquely there was a role model in that school of a young woman who had come from exactly that community uh, and, and spoke the language in every sense of that word uh, and people could relate to her. Uh, that, that is a problem and we have to address it and I would in fact welcome uh, comments from the MPC in due course as to how best we can do that. Thank you. And I think Joyce just wants to... I would to just say that that isn't different from the states, that uh, exactly the, the comment and story and uh, reality that we hear, um, we never look back on the work that we do. We always look forward. And what we've found is that the parents who may have had a, a difficult time in school themselves, um, they are there. But they have the best hopes for their children. And we start with that as the starting point. And the notion of um, reputation of a school that's either welcoming to those who are, have less formal education than those who are easiest to talk to is part of the declaration of a school that we are a partnership place. We're taking a new route here. We're going to take a new path to partnership and work with you in a different way. Many of our schools will start that off declaring we are a partnership school. They'll have a kickoff, picnic, before school starts, before anybody's in trouble, before any difficulties have been identified. And they'll give everyone a t-shirt. We're a partnership school. Uh, and everyone is welcome. Come for uh, lunch and meet the teachers and see the school. You are welcome. and have parents inviting the other parents who are more reluctant or who have been wary of the school. Oh, that school's on a different path. And we're going to really take this seriously. And you can see those stories in the books from the sites that have had these very same experiences. To us at Johns Hopkins University, where my staff is, those are the inspirational stories that keep us going. Because we can, t we can say it, but we can't make it happen. You have to really do that with a creative and an inventive way to reach families who really have not been involved before. They were excluded. They were dismissed. And the notion is to be able to bring them into this picture. But it's not an, a magic pill. It's a process that has to be worked at, and it, it can, in fact, be done. Okay, thank you. I, we've got about five minutes left, so I, I know this is a very difficult ask, but if we can keep um, answers quite short so we can get through a couple of questions maybe before the end. Joyce, then, um, given Ireland's poor performance recently in communication with parents around children's academ academic achievement in recent international research, what would be your recommendation to our Department of Education and Skills to improve the situation? Well, if I could may wave a magic wand, you know, uh, that too is not really unlike what's happening elsewhere. Uh, if you ask parents how, how good is your school, most parents will say their schools are pretty good. If you ask par uh, non-parents, par uh, citizens who have no children in the school, they'll say that <laughs> the schools are weak. Uh, but the ones who know the schools really are generally happy with their schools. That doesn't mean that they're satisfied with the connections around curriculum. That's the hardest type of involvement. Type four in our framework, the learning at home, the connections about the child as a student, is the most challenging and the most difficult. So the, the way that we address that in the steps that I was sharing with you is to make sure that the action plan for partnership is focused on two academic goals. My school might choose reading and math, and that sounds like the literacy and numeracy in, um, initiative that you have going. But your school might say, well, family involvement is really in about writing and science. They're important, too. We're going to work on that. That will help the teachers start to work with parents on the subject areas, on the academic areas. And so the only way out is through. And the only way through is with planning. And the best way to do that, we found, after many false starts way back when we were first learning how to do this work, is to take this team approach with a, pl a structured plan that helps people see how are we going to work with families this year on these subjects. And then the non-academic area can, in fact, be bullying. Anti-bullying activities is very popular 
topic for that third page of the plan uh, and then to work as building a partnership place so it just t it takes the action we could wish it we could hope for it we could say this needs to be done but without the action part of it it is just more talk we could come back five years from now we have the same conversation don't want to do that okay thank you just you very briefly on that I think the school self-evaluation uh, and the way in which the inspectorate in the department uh, has transformed and is transforming the relationship between the department and the schools is the way forward and I think uh, engaging parents uh, in that process uh, will in fact enable people to get a much better understanding first and foremost of what's happening in the school and will also give the school I think a much greater self confidence in doing this kind of project because any organization worth its salt no matter what it is whether it's a football team or a company uh, or a political party is constantly in the process of self-evaluation it's a normal part of a healthy human organizational response uh, and therefore and it's all now online anyway so you can access it and I think that will over time um, make the place achieve its optimal potential rather than uh, underachieve Thank you. Um, now I, I've one um, that I've pulled out of the Minister's box which is more of a comment so then I'll go on to a question afterwards but I'll read the comment out first. Rolling out of ASHTA training for preschool personnel is imperative. Must be seen in the context of continuum, continuum of naught to six years. Much effort is currently going into ASHTA for primary teachers. I am a tutor. But we need to see the big picture and give equal time and input to preschool sector and of course the parent cohort no half measures. Astra is great and to be fully supported but we can't do it piecemeal. Nought to six is a foundation and we need the rollout to be seamless and for each sector to recognize and understand their role on the continuum. So I, th I very much agree with that and just to tell you that in that extended year uh, of teacher education not teacher training uh, we are focusing not only on that aspect but also on children with special learning needs. Uh, because in fact we are trying to mainstream children with learning difficulties and learning needs uh, and in order for that to be fully achieved and, and have the kind of outcomes that we want uh, the teachers who in the past weren't necessarily open to that particular kind of understanding uh, are open to it and that is part and parcel of the uh, change in the initial teacher education uh, changes that I spoke about earlier. Okay, and then just a quick question to finish on, Minister, because I know we're getting very tight for time. Certain schools in Tullamore still send out letters telling parents where to buy the uniform. The cost of navy trousers are too expensive to buy in this shop. Why can't schools just let you buy the navy trousers from Dunn stores that cost 10 euro compared to the 39.99? I agree with this. Um, we have suggested, and it, this has been brought to my attention, this is really a responsibility in the public private partnership relationship that I spoke about briefly. This is really in the sphere that you represent. Uh, this is parent power. Uh, there's no reason why a school um, can't, in fact, sell the, the emblem, the badge, the crest, and, and pick a generic color. Um, and that the market will respond to that. Now there are arguments that the people who are engaged in producing uniforms are going to lose jobs etc but uh, that, that will have to be dealt with. They can specialize in producing badges um, but it is, it is an enormous cost and it's not just the school uniform. The uniform frequently changes from uh, junior school and senior school uh, for very good reasons uh, which I support uh, but I think th the cost of uh, even in, in, in relatively good times, the cost of school uniforms are prohibitive. And then um, you get a teenager whose attachment to their school uniform is semi-detached uh, and uh, frequently gets lost. So I would strongly support it. But I can't send a directive to the schools in question and say you have to change your uniform policy. You, the parents, can change that uniform policy, not the department. Okay, and I think Joyce has a very and, quick... Uh, we have many examples in the States uh, uh, on our school family community partnership plan and program on page four, the welcoming partnership uh, climate where, especially at the primary level, uh, in disadvantaged communities, they'll have a uniform swap shop in the school 
so that when parents, when children grow two inches, they don't have to buy a new uniform. They actually swap them for the next size because they've turned in another size. That takes, again, the teamwork, the planning to have such a program because it takes a little bit of organization. But that is quite common, not just in schools that have uniforms, but in, in poor neighborhoods where children's clothing is part of the swap shop. So, um, and uh, you'll see those in the books of Promising Partnership Practices under many different names. One I recall is the, the Tiger's, Clo Tiger's, Clo Tiger's Clothes Closet. Tiger was the mascot of the school and they had a clothes closet. So a very interesting way of dealing again with, with this issue from another side. Thank you, Joyce. Um, I'd, I'd just like to thank both speakers for the questions and answer session, and, and Robert's going to thank them formally in a minute. But just before I hand back to Robert, just a few other housekeeping um, about lunch. Lunch is going to be served in the cafeteria straight across, but the tea and coffee is going to be served outside where it was served this morning. And, and again, as Robert said, there's a stand, so please, if you didn't have time to visit them this morning, please um, continue to look at them this afternoon. Um, and I think, oh, and on the way out, if you could come out of this door, because you'll be handed the question sheets for our speakers this afternoon. And there's some speakers sitting already in the audience who can't wait to hear what the questions are going to be. So um, I'll hand you over to Robert, who's going to more formally thank our guest speakers. Thank you. Um, very briefly, because I think um, you have responded to both uh, Dr. Epstein and the Minister. But I think that uh, we feel that uh, books always contain knowledge and we'd like just to give a, s a small uh, gift to both the Minister and to Joyce. One for reading back on the plane, the other one for becoming more involved even further with education. So, so Joyce, if I could just ask you to come forward and we'll make this presentation to you. So I've been told they're not all books. So, and I, I, I will have to. I think uh, uh, Anya has ensured that the lesser present goes to the minister. But for, uh, uh, only I would add for good corporate governance. And I minister the big prize.